There was once a man who was living just fine. Then in a moment, everything changed. Stage four, pancreatic cancer, with around 180 days left to live. In the wake of his sadness, the man found hope in an empty jar. He made the choice to break routine and start filling up his life with things that truly mattered. He called these final days Blue Marble Days. And after each one, he'd go home and drop a marble inside. The man eventually passed, but his legacy? Well, that's what sparked all this. Drink. Hey, do you have an extra fanny pack by any chance? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, 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 I don't even remember, like, when I got to Tulane, I didn't feel like I had any real clue what, and why I was even in college. It seemed natural that I join a fraternity. And I was pledging that fraternity my freshman year in the spring when Mardi Gras rolls around. You know, being a pledge, I had some specific things I had to do. And I remember that night I was supposed to be guarding the Porta Johns, and I get a call, and it's one of the brothers who's, who's essentially telling me that I got to come to the parade spot because I've been selected to be the first bead pledge for Mardi Gras. And being this B pledge means that essentially I'm the jester for the for the night. Come here, all beads. Real slow. Keep going. You got it. You got it. You got it. That everyone puts their beads on top of my head and just shoves alcohol down my throat until I pass out, and then someone puts me in a car, and I eventually get back to a couch on the fraternity house. Uh, the problem was that night the second part didn't actually happen. I didn't make it in a car, and I definitely didn't make it on a couch. I woke up the next morning, 45 minutes away, naked in a hospital bed with no phone and no wallet. And I just, I don't know if I had ever experienced just fear to that level. Just the disappointment I felt. I felt like a failure. Like I, I so desperately wanted just to belong. And uh, I found a community of people that I thought was a brotherhood. And I just felt alone. film like any good story that the energy and the heart we're putting behind it is just only like increasing as as it's progressing we can't get tired of it and the story yeah oh of course I'm gonna keep you there to the finish
pour everything we got. What's up, guys? Welcome, welcome. Um, all right, guys. So, first off, thanks for coming. You this Pretty, uh, guess what, Shanae? Over here. I think there's always been some level of mystery around what we've actually done in the past couple of years. Uh, are they so in school? Are they not in school? Are they in Asia? Are they in Thailand? Like, you know, it's never really been super clear. So this whole thing is its kind of just like going back and then the evolution of, of how it all came to be. And the funny, the funny thing is, you know, when we started, when we really began this journey, we had a dream. But the danger of a dream is it's never going to look like what you thought it was going to look like. Ever since I was a little kid, I had this dream of running out from the tunnel on Saturdays and imagining the crowd and, and everyone just going wild. And, and my dream of playing college football was something that always drove me. So I was willing to sacrifice and do whatever it took to come and make that dream a, a reality. The spring game rolls around and my dad flies in and I have all this excitement and, and this nervousness is stirring around in my stomach. I'm lined up, quarterback calls an audible and the ball sails over my head and I jump up and corner comes and just goes. I get diagnosed with a concussion. Every morning I wake up, it feels like there's just like an elephant sitting on my head. I get this feeling of not knowing who that person was when I look in, into the mirror and it'd scare the shit out of me. And it was all my, my confidence, all my gusto and, and just life had just been sucked out of me. I didn't know how to tell my friends this. I didn't know how to tell my family this because they still, in, in my head, had these expectations of me to, to be that flesh. You know, we, we mistake certain physical markers for health. So you, you could say, I came back from the doctor and I got a clean bill of health. I don't believe that's, that's true. Health is not just the, the, the manifestation of certain physical signs. It is easier sometimes to do those other things when physically you feel good, but that's not what health is. Like health is a kind of robust sense of the world where you want to give to it. You know, it was after the, the symptoms of the concussion were gone and the doctor said, hey, you know, if you want to think when you're older, you have to stop playing football and, and hang up the cleats. And I was just like, it's everything I knew about myself. It's everything that I had sacrificed it was to come play football. And now I just got that taken away. My whole identity was just crushed. We are social animals. Humans are social animals. We don't exist in, in a bubble. We, we may jocularly say, aha, in Facebook I have so many followers, but we also need, we also want to feel connected. We also want to feel part of somebody, part of a system. We say it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village forever. From birth till death, it takes a village. There are re real big myths about what love is and what happiness is in our modern world. And if you define them wrong, they are not related at all, uh, or maybe related in the wrong way. So be because happiness is very different, the Western culture 
uh, in the absence of happiness sort of replaces happiness with that quick buzz that we call fun. Uh, it's like, let's go to a party somewhere and just listen to loud music and have a couple of drinks and laugh a little bit and think of that as happiness. That goes really, really well with conditional love. We're, we're the product of history. And I think we have to be honest when we look back at our own history and that need to consume, that need to hoard, that need to take. It's part of Western civilization. That's, that's, that's all of this, our history. What we're talking about is rooted in the history of how we got to where we are today. I felt like a lot of my friends had really betrayed me, and like left me there. So I just, I don't know, I was forced to really rethink a lot of things, forced to rethink who I was hanging around and who Henry was, because I, I realized that night that I didn't like this direction I was going. I didn't like myself when I would just have this one track mind to get as drunk as I could. And so I started trying to make changes in my life. I had to go on this voyage in order to figure out who I was because I had completely lost myself. So in order to find myself, I knew I had to go on this journey. And the only thing I knew how to do was to run. Nola, I appreciate the times. I appreciate the love, um, but ta-ta for now. I like this one. Organizing the car when you're camping. Welcome to the closet. That's pitching in here. <laughs> and we have nowhere to stay. That's the world's largest pistachio. The largest! Told you, but uh, he just did a quick bathe in the sewer. Yeah. Most people think you can't. Do you cactus? A nice retirement balloon. I like to name my rocks. I like to talk to my rocks. <laughs> That's where we slept right there. I don't think any of this audio is picking up. Rich, no, 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 no. I haven't had to go. I've been here for nine years. <laughs> Well, we've just been getting lost a lot because we haven't had a map. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I should worry, oh, but my worry's growing thin. And I know that I should hurry because I don't get life again, no, no. I know I don't know anything, I don't want to know no more. Oh, I actually have to pee. You going to the bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> And I'm feeling best when I get no rest The ultimate test, I'm heading out west I know that I'm blessed, but guess what? I'm not content I thought I'd be a surfer, but my balance wasn't great Still I didn't mind the fall and I had a great day I met a new friend, we stayed out late I thought that I could love her, but she forgot my name I think it's all about the moment I think it's all about the moment it's all about the moment. I think it's all about the moment. I think it's all about the moment. I think it's all about the better, better, better. You know, better, better, better. I think it's all about the better, better, better. I've wandered across this blue and green. I've wondered plenty. What does this all mean? I've stopped. I've took a breath. But if I'm not moving, those are memories I'm losing. I've been choosing the best to surround myself by. I've been puffing my chest, but I'd much rather hide. Best roadmap for the life you lead last in your dreams. And I know I should worry, oh, but my worry's growing thin. And I know that I should hurry, cause I don't, I don't. Little better, better.
I think young people, all of us included, I think everyone is looking for love. And we'll do anything we can to find it. So some people are on a journey where they are like, they're looking for every area or the love that they never received when they were young. Every emotion is surprisingly felt exactly the same way in every culture. The interesting uh, difference between all of us is how we respond, how we, how we define and respond to the stimuli that gets us into those emotions and how we prioritize them. I'm about to take you on a tour of the Healing House. Here we go. What is the Zen Palace? I think we describe it as a commune of sorts, but it's this lady, her name's Lauren Rock, and she is a, a psychic energy healer. Um, and she opens up her house for different entrepreneurs, creators, uh, people to come in and stay for stents at a time. Um, don't fudge is in here right now. Oh. Oh. Watch. She's created this gym known as Gold's Gym, which she spray painted it all gold. You have a fire pit and then a super grassy area where you can do yoga. Yeah, it just kind of created this environment back there. There was tons of plants and a garden, a bunch of oranges and lemons um, that we could actually just finally relax. We're going this way with it? And it was funny because even before I get there, I get this text from Lauren and she says, I can't wait for you to get here and meet Augie. I think you're going to create something beautiful together. You know, my first experience with, with Augie was he like brought me in and he like started asking about blue marble. And it was like this like new moon ceremony. And like he was lighting up all these like incenses. I'm like, who is this dude sort of thing? You in camera? It's about 8 o'clock in the morning, and what are you about to do? Go to school. Go to which grade? First grade. First grade. And what is the most exciting thing that's going to happen to you today? Nothing. No, that's, that's right. Nothing. Because because um, they didn't get the playground built, so I can't go outside. Oh, that'll let you go outside. Are My you earliest memory is also one of the most important memories. I was at a fair and they asked for volunteers to come on stage to play instruments and I was on my dad's shoulders and uh, I raised my hand immediately and then they picked me and I came up on stage, they gave me a tambourine and I was just banging away. I think I was three years old. And I had a moment where I went outside of myself and could see myself. We grew up uh, originally in Seattle and then we moved out to Kingston, Washington and had a very, normal life. First we have Augie. Uh -huh. Now, watch out Augie, I'm not, I'm not, oh, okay, here we have another lizard. Very good, can you smile with the fish face? Okay, Are you, can you be sad with the fish face? Ah, uh -huh. very good. Now Augie, this morning you got a bee sting, didn't you? One day I came home my parents took me us out in the back on the picnic table and they told us 
uh, that they were splitting up, that it was over. And it was a massive shock to me. And that became a really dark period for in my life. I went from being a straight A student, involved in a lot of different external activities to slowly degrading. And I was also very eccentric. And um, so I was made fun of a lot already and definitely just called a faggot all the time. Even though I didn't identify as homosexual, it was just the anger behind it. And it's just the, the, the pain that people were putting on me. Went through one just episode after another and slipped into this really deep, deep depression. Ended up having to leave the school that I was in. Um, one day I was at my grandma's house and um, just decided that the best thing for me to do at this point was just to end it. There will always be pain. We live in a broken world. People are broken. The world is broken. Like we just live in a broken world. And suffering is actually the control of people that want to cause their control over the world to happen, right? Sometimes it happens to us or sometimes we cause that suffering on other people. That when there is pain, it is a sign that we've gone too far from our core. We've gone too far from our, from our fundamental nature. And the pain is, the, is, a, is a calling telling us return. I'm sitting at a table at a treatment unit and there's a doctor, a police officer, and a counselor, and then my parents. And they just asked me, do you want to get better? And I said, yeah, I want to get better. And the doctor said, I want you to remember the last time you were really happy. And I remember the very first moment in my life when I, when I was three and I was on that stage and I was playing that tambourine. And then that became, he said, I want you to hold on to that image. I want you to hold on to that image and that's what, we're gonna get you there. We're gonna get you back to that image. And that was, that was how I was able to, uh, to heal, to heal. Hi, Baba. Doc Zader is on egg patrol here. Oh, that, no. <laughs> Something happened to that egg. Egg, egg, oh, dang, egg. <laughs> figure out what kind of shots we need. Terrible sore throat right now. Really bad. Thank you. There's just a front and back, so for both of you guys. Okay, nice. You can probably use this clipboard if you want. How long are you guys gonna be there? Um, well, we're actually going, we're going to 12 countries in 30 days. Mm, wow. So that's going to be... Uh, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> we're, following, we're following this guy around. Okay. Um, he's, <laughs> he's a love wizard. Um, he's a what? <laughs> a love wizard? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question that oftentimes you start to ask yourself and it's like, why am I here? What am I doing here? What does this, all this mean? 
what is God, um, what's the point? And so around 25, I asked myself that question, what am I here for, like, why am I here? I would see street performers and I had this feeling in myself that I, gosh, you know, like, I, that feels like I wanna do that. There's something in me that wanted to do that, but it just in my mind felt like I wasn't supposed to or something. I had this idea of what if there was somebody that was on the street performing who didn't want anything. The only thing they wanted was to spread joy, to give love, to give the energy of love. The year that I was born in, in 1983, my dad invented these, um, these cards. <clears throat> and they're these little pop-open cards. And so they were around me my whole life. They have little inspiration, little notes inside of them. Put in my two weeks notice, and that, that week that I put in my two weeks, so every day after work, I went downtown and I just dressed up as this character. I made these signs that said hope and love, and, and I handed out these cards to people just to make their day. I didn't want any money, I didn't want anything in return. And I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't know, I just felt like I had to do it. I was talking to a friend and he says to me, I really like your performing art, you're a performing artist. And I, no one had ever said that to me before. Like no one had said you're an artist. And there was this permission that was granted to myself as an artist where I felt, oh my gosh, I'm an artist, I, I'm an artist. In the same time, it felt like I was connecting to something higher. There was a, I was channeling this energy, this spirit, the, the, the pure spirit of my soul, the, the everything that you see when a little kid's chasing after a bubble or when, when they're dancing to music all of a sudden randomly, it was, I was connecting to this, the source energy of myself. You need to feel that it's important to follow your own path. And you need to feel that the world needs me, which I believe it does. I believe it needs everybody. I mean, it needs each of us trying to be of help. And so Augie for the past three, four years has gone around the world um, handing out these, these cards of affirmation in an effort to raise the vibration of love. But we start to realize that he really, even if I don't necessarily agree with everything he does or believes, he's very selfless in his intent on this mission. And I wanted to know, is he actually succeeding in this attempt to spread love? And I, I actually, it's, it was really, you know, how does a, a man with such a simple message impact a largely selfish world, right? And, and I wanted, and I, and I almost had to know, I was so curious about what he was doing and was it actually working? Was he doing anything? And, and what does it really mean to spread love? Well, this is my second to last performance in, on my trip before I take a little breather. But I am supercharged, ready to spread the seed of love. You meet a lot of people, but you're not, you're, you're in a place and you're having this moment and you're like, wow, this is amazing. And there's nobody there to share it with. And as humans, a lot of our life is meant to share. I came back home after the first half of my mission and I felt like I, it was okay for me at this point to have a, a base and that the mission was gonna be different this time. I was sitting outside at the Zen Palace and I was writing in my journal about everything that was going on. And Henry comes outside, he's like, dude, I'm really feeling called to go over in, to Africa with Augie and tell his story and I need you to go with me. And I look at him Hell no, dude. Like, there's no way we can go over to Africa. It doesn't make sense. Every time I thought about it, there were just moments of like fear and anxiety that would come up in my head and in my body and it would tighten me up. 
and it was because I was resisting. I was resisting this whole trip. I was resisting this inner feeling, this inner purpose that I was supposed to go and tell this guy's story. And the more I resisted, the more I could feel it in my body, the more I could feel it in, in my days and that the angst was building up. I could feel that I was running from something instead of like running for something, running into something. Up. Um, yeah, I guess we gotta go to the airport so we don't miss a flight. We're off to see the wizard. The wonderful wizard love. Alright! Whoa, that's heavy. Whatever, mama's boy. Mm, yeah. <sighs> this is so heavy. <sighs> What is love? What is self-love? And how do we connect to others in, in a world that I think is increasingly telling us that we need to find love in other places, right? find love in this kind of romantic Hollywood ideal, but also you know, self-love in terms of being the best and having the most. I think it's interesting to think about how these cultural views of love, things that we hear maybe from Hollywood, the messages we get um, of what love is, actually changes our experience, right? That our feelings can kind of map on to how we've defined it culturally. All right, like, well, I, like, my oops is like 10 minutes out, and then I get my Alrighty, yeah, it sounds good. I think, yeah. I mean, I know the, the subway line. It's a quick, quick hop over to Union, Union Square. So as soon as you get here, we're ready to roll. All right. Alrighty, Wiz. See you soon. See ya. I just talked to the Wiz. He's on his way over here, but we're going to meet up with Matthew Silver. So this guy is somewhat of a legend in New York, um, and people know him for this being this eccentric street performer. A naked guy runs around here in Times Square for most of the afternoon like a wild man, uninhibited and unimpeded. Um, really, this guy's message, there's, there's so much meat to it in what he's saying. And so he's the one that really thought out this term, love consciousness, that has, in a lot of ways, inspired Augie to do what he's doing. What the hell am I getting myself into? What is this wizard going to do? What is his performance? And I was so in my own head about trying to formulate all these expectations. Yeah. yeah. And, and did you want to collaborate? Yeah, yeah. Right. That was the whole, yeah. like, was this going to, like, vibe? Well, I have a And the first thing Augie does is he goes and draws this huge heart in the middle of Union Square and calls it the love zone. And they just start doing the most absurd things. <laughs> Anyway, this is it. Anyway, you don't have to change a thing. I was honestly, I was pretty scared because Augie had introduced us to the, to this character, Matthew Silver. And, you know, I was a little intimidated to meet the wizard. And this guy was just on the next level of just absurdity. Oh, yeah! Surrender now! Yeah! Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I went up to this guy. And I'm like, hey man, what are you seeing? The most positive people in the world. What is it about them to make them so positive? I mean, what's, what's negative about them? Nothing. Nothing, that's what it's about. They're just out here. They may be crazy, but they're preaching positivity. What's better than that? People spend five minutes here just watching that and have a better day. That's what I'm doing, at least. And I sat there with those words and just felt a layer of my, my onion skin just leave me right there. And he was my light bulb for the day. I think
think he I think he read the emotion in my face. I literally like just got off of a bad phone call. I had tears in my eyes. He looked at me, he's like, feel the love! I just felt the energy. I feel like, you know, life is as serious as you take it and we need some of this in this fucking city. Where everybody looks at each other like they're disposable, you know? When you are conscious about your intention and you're conscious about that intention being centered around love, then that's what you project. You know, pretty, pretty instantly, Fletch and I had to decide, like, are we gonna kind of stay on the, on the edge of this whole thing or are we doing it? In a sense, at the very core of existence or the very core of reality or the very core of, of consciousness, there is a call, there is love calling. Love is, making, love is uh, sending out a, a call. And when it comes through our consciousness, depending on what's the present there, it seems to be desire, it seems to be I want this or I want that. In essence, we are one. Maybe to strive to achieve that level of love, that highest level of really divine love where it's a recognition of oneness and not, no longer distinguish between self and other. Because the truth is, the more I can love myself, the more my capacity deepens to love another. The more I love another, the more that love arises in me so that I can give it to another. So then it's ultimately also in me. Are we gonna dive in and actually just go head first into this whole thing? And New York set the tone. It set the tone for the trip. It set the tone for what to expect. It affirmed our belief that this is a message that people need to hear. New York, Brooklyn. It's been super real, dudes. But it's uh, it's off to Ethiopia. I'm not really sure where the heck is. It's, it's not that many people go to Ethiopia. Hey, what's your name? I remember we're sitting in the airport and we're eating kind of our last American meal. I just remember uh, getting a call from my older brothers and they call me and they, they conference me in and they just say, Henry, we're worried about you. We just don't think you've thought this trip out. I'm thinking to myself, what have I done? I have just made a huge mistake. I can't believe I am allowing these guys to come on this trip. And I, I felt this immense amount of responsibility all of a sudden. And it's starting to kind of hit me. You don't know what countries you're going into. You're going into it with the wizard who's gonna be running around like, how are people gonna perceive this? And I had no idea what was gonna happen when we got to Ethiopia. I had no idea how this was, this was gonna be received. This is dangerous, like, what are you doing? First time in the streets. Uh, we're already making friends. As you can see. This guy comes up to us and, and says, "Culture and dance." And us being very trusting people, and me being very open to new experiences, I'm like, "Yeah, let's do it. Culture dance." And we're walking, we're walking, and we start getting into of an odd part of town, I'd say. But, you know, culture and dance, it can happen anywhere. We have no idea where we're going. 
starting to kind of put the guard up like maybe this isn't the best idea but we're gonna see what happens and we walk in the house and just get berated by women we come back we're coming back we'll come back yeah thank you we'll come back and look to our right drugs on the table and they're just hugging us like trying to just coerce us into the house and pretty quickly um, contrary to maybe what Fletch wanted at the time I was curious we turned around and, and got out of there about as quickly as we came in welcome thank you Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You made it. I'm here. I made it. It was 35 years in the making. I think in the same way that like an individual develops a belief system or a family network develops a belief system, a nation develops a belief system. I think there's, you know, the lie that other cultures will like bring down our socioeconomic status or other cultures will bring in an ideology that we don't want or, or other cultures are, aren't as intelligent or, or whatever, whatever they've experienced or their prejudices have told them. We're in a point in time right now when we have to pay attention to what we're seeing before us. We can't divorce or pretend that the things that are in front of us don't have a history and don't have a meaning. We can't pretend to not see color. We can't pretend that what we're looking at, uh, the, the spaces that we inhabit or embody as people don't matter. The fact that Fletch and I even have the ability to tell the story in the first place, to go over there, and understanding the history of imperialism in the human race of, of white people going into third world countries, trying to, to help, right? And so, I definitely battled with that of uh, what's the best way to go about that because our intention wasn't that, right? Our intention wasn't even to help people but simply to love people and the next place Augie just happened to be going was Africa. The willingness to sit down and go, oh, this is the way I'm being perceived. This is the way my presence impacts the world around me. It's not a, it's not a journey. We have to stop being willful in our ignorance, and we have to actually start examining where, who we are and what we're broadcasting. Hi, walking down the runway, about to board the flight. That is all that she wrote on Ethiopia. What a stop, what a country. I learned a lot. Next stop, Uganda. You know, most of the time you, you meet someone on the plane, you're like, all right, well, good luck with your life. And we added a friend, Ben. <laughs> My man. His name is Bernard, and he had been gone from, from his home country, from Kampala, for an entire year, cutting hair to try to make some money for his family. Our drone ends up getting taken in security. It's Ben that instead of seeing his, he sees his family through the window. They're right outside the door. And he makes the decision to stay with us. <laughs> oh my gosh. Found the squad. <laughs> oh, what's up, Uncle? Fletcher. Uh, just to be able to step into this bubble of love. And it was the most welcome I've ever felt anywhere in my life. Just immediately being able to experience just, just love. We had traveled to Uganda really to meet this one love warrior who Augie had been communicating with back and forth. And his name was Kuru. All right, so here's what is happening right now. Um, we're going to meet Akuru. Augie, aka the Wiz, 
<laughs> has talked to you for over a year, Hugs? Yeah, I haven't met him yet. It's my first time meeting him. Over a year. Hey, bro. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> 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 What's up? I'm Fletcher. Uh, I'm George. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Welcome to Uganda. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Real life, man. Yeah. I see you. I'm so happy that you you're here. It's not boring because it's keep moving. The water which keep moving. He teaches dance and yoga to women, kids all over uh, Uganda, and. His dream is to do it all over Africa. Oh! Wow! Wow! <laughs> and today we are going to be on the street spreading love, peace, and unity to people of Uganda. And they should know that we are different colors, but we are one people. We are one. It's not all about the color, but we are one. And we have to make this one to come in reality. So I and he's not asking for anything for it. He has a genuine people. belief and a genuine love. When we go out into the world and we are giving, 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 and we end up and uh, having a, a, not abundance in a, in a selfish way, like, or give so that you can get kind of thing, but we, we end up making ourselves almost like a, a servant or steward of, of, of love, so that through us, love can help others uh, gain fulfillment because that's what love wants. Love wants others to, uh, to be happy and we, are, we sort of sign up, okay, I want to be one of your agents. When, he, when we first started communicating, he explained to me his living situation a little bit, but it wasn't until we actually went into the slums, when he brought us into the slums, and showed us that he was living in a about a 10 by 10 concrete slab. How are you? Nice to meet you. Hello. <laughs> and it's him and his brother and his mom living in, in this tiny space. This for me was, was probably the most impactful moment of the trip. And we were able to meet his his brother and his his mom and we interviewed Akurut and his mom in their house. I just remember uh, you know Augie had shared this moment with Akurut's mom where he felt her hands and he asked her when was the last time she had taken a day off and she just couldn't even really understand the question. And you know, coming to find out that she's terminally ill, and she still is just every single day, every single moment, sacrificing for her kids. There are people who are going through life who are figuring out things like survival. How do I eat? How do I feed my family? That's their primary concern, and it's valid. There are times in our lives when Simply surviving trumps contemplations of love. Those of us who are hearing this and who have the great fortune of living relatively safe, abundant lives, who have our needs met, we are in a position of responsibility to, to model, to role model for those who are not. We are responsible to extend our love. We are responsible to become our best selves and be compassionate and be and, and train our minds and become, become refuges, if you want to call it that, for those who don't necessarily have the ability to access deep self-love and compassion because they have other things to deal with. So it's a step back. Yeah, like when you're this one, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Uh, somebody had come to Uganda and had brought yoga practice and he was in an accident when he was a kid where uh, 
a, a car actually ran over his back and he has this incredible scar on his back and it really caused him problems as, as he grew up as an adult and yoga he found healed his body. So we're at the place that Akuru is going to teach yoga today. Um, with... His mission, what he explained to me, was to bring yoga to all of Africa and the purpose being so that people can reunite with themselves. It was a genuine love and support for one another and a lot of people were like messing up here, messing up there with yoga in, in certain poses, but it wasn't about that. It was about the coming together and moving your body as a group. Bring your hands to your center and then you twist your body. Take it more and then you will hear the benefit from your back. It was so cool to be able to connect and see him at, in his work and see how healing this was for these people um, to come together in community, to come together and move their bodies. It's a great opportunity to be an individual in your own expression in community. We don't look alike at all, so I am here with you, I see you. It's so powerful to be seen. I mean, I think at our root, that is like, hey, um, here I am, and, and, and I'm an individual, and so I might need to take side plank on my knee, or I might take my side plank and go this huge expression, and I'm still okay, I'm still here in community with you, I'm not isolated. And they just started bouncing tunes, and people were going in and dancing, and. And I was watching these ladies go in and just shake their hips and these little kids go in and like move their bones like I've never seen. And I wasn't really allowing myself to kind of go participate in the, the dance and then whew, I'm in the middle of the circle. I don't know why I was dancing like I was dancing, but I think it was because I let go. And when I let go, my hips start doing funny things and I don't argue with them. After that, it was just such a, an awesome interaction with these kids and you know, I'd, I'd dance and then they'd dance and then they'd show me like different dances and then I'd like give them a high five and just kind of run around with them and, and offer so much just energy for them and, and, you know, receiving that too. May we all shine into the world as we all go down to the mat. Thank you for that last hour. Uh, we we're at the, the Ben's Hair Clinic with Ben's. <laughs> little children, you know, in, in behaviorism, will, before conditioning, little children are just one with everything. You give them you know, the experiments of um, Little Albert, which were the origin of behaviorism in psychology. You know, you give Little Albert a, a white rat or a puppy or a, uh, or a snake and the child doesn't differentiate. It doesn't see that boundary of there is me and there is something else and the other thing is a, is a threat or something I should dislike or should have aversion towards. If you look at life this way, there is nothing but love. There's absolutely nothing. It's, it's, the, it's the default setting. You start from, uh, I love you, I love everything. I love every, everything that ever came my way is my default setting. So what you need to know to do to get back to that default is to remove the things that affected you differently. It's to remove that separation. It's, removed, it's to remove that 
view of like, uh, I dislike this person because he's different than I am or because she's different than I am and go back to I like this person because there is so much more in common between us than there is that is different. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> So nice to meet you. Bye. Bye-bye. Hi. How are you? Oh, wow, I think love and forgiveness are very close. They're like cousins. I think forgiveness is, is, a, is an attribute of love. I think someone who loves wants the happiness of other self or other. I think that's my definition of love, is genuinely wanting the welfare, the happiness of the other. In order for you to love someone, you have to actually first love yourself, which sounds countercultural. But how can I give away what I don't first have, right? So forgiveness is the same way for me. If I haven't received forgiveness, then I will always use people to meet my needs. So it doesn't do away with the pain that's happened to you, but it does do away with the pain that you once felt and now you're free from. It becomes a story. So now it's a scar. You know, Jesus was some crazy hippie who said, love everybody, even your enemies. Holy crap, love your enemies, that's insanity. Especially 2,000 years ago, very brutal world. How do you do that? On the other hand, you think, if I can love my enemies, how can they hurt me? If I am so uh, secure and so comfortable with who I am and connecting to people in the world, and someone hates me, it doesn't hurt me anymore. When we forgive, what we're mostly doing is taking away our own excuses for not being kind. And, and in that way, every time we forgive, we're a little bit of a peacemaker. It'll hold you back from being your best self. But if you deal with your woundedness, you become kinder and friends with it, then the next person who harms you, you say, well, you know, one, I learned how to deal with this. And two, this may just be part of this life where I have to, I have to grow in this capacity. Head to the airport, but uh, it's more now, right? We're very tired and we get on the plane, fly out of Entebbe into Nairobi. Nairobi is a massive city in Kenya. All right, make the future generation bright. Oh, yes, Steve. 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 <laughs> yeah. You made it to Kenya. We get there and scope out the scene and it's just hustle and bustle and lots of people all around. So Augs goes and he, he runs to a public restroom. There's a line out the door and he's changing into his whiz suit and he just comes out and everyone is like, what? As Augie was whizzing out around uh, the city, this guy came and approached me and asked me, he's like, what are you guys doing? You know, I gave him the, the spiel, like exploring, you know, what is, what is love and all this stuff. And this professor, he flips the tables and starts interviewing me. And I find myself in the hot seat. And he's asking me these questions like, how do I love? What does that word mean to me? And I'm trying my, like my best to answer these questions. And the most powerful part of my interaction with this professor was when he would grab people off the streets, random people. He'd say, look at this person in the eyes. Do you know him? I'd say, no. He's like, tell him you love him. 
and give him a hug. And I'd embrace and a hug with him. And then what he did was he, he'd like put him behind me. So it was like almost like a, a semicircle of like a football, like a yeah, football huddle of people. And he did it probably with like 10 to 15 people, like a little boy coming by, like a child. He's like, do you know this kid? I'm like, no. It's like, look him in the eyes and tell him you love him. And that moment for me was when I started to figure out how to love a stranger. How you could look another human in the eyes and say, damn, you're another human. I don't know you, but I love you. Our true nature is unconditional love. The reason why we are so caught up in conditional love is because of conditioning. Your nature, if you really, really, really understand the reality of who we are as beings, the truth is, the truth is there is something to you more than your physical form. So I, I'm not, I don't release oxytocin when I do something kind for you. I only release it when you reciprocate. And that's the freaking crazy ass stupid stressor about love. I have to give and hope I'll get it in return. And that is a leap of faith. That's, that's the, the stupid part about love. I have to give it first and I may or may not get it back. This is what love on display looks like for everyone to see and watching this crowd gather around and for me to just witness this and just to sit back and listen. We come into to Tanzania and to Zanzibar and it's Ramadan. We have just made it to Zanzibar and it's about one in the morning. We go into where we are supposed to check in and there's this lady sitting there and we tell her like, hey, like, we're here. Okay, so okay, guys, you know what? <laughs> now I have to tell you something really hilarious. No bad. Okay, so the thing is, uh, as I spoke, I, I was thinking that you guys are coming tomorrow night. Yeah. But you came tonight. Yeah. So your room is occupied tonight. Okay. But funny thing is, it's occupied by me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got here at three in the morning. They didn't know we were coming. Um, and what's going on, guys? We're, we're staying with Tina, who's <laughs> the manager. I think a mosquito got in our net. So nine days until I get started and who knows what's going to happen. I'm going to meet so many, so many more incredible people along the way and yeah, anyone is welcome to come and join me, help spread this message of love to the world. Almost immediately, once people figured out what we were doing, they're like, you have to meet Nick. You have to meet this guy. He's crazy like you guys. And he's spreading love. Like, okay, like whatever you say. And it was the, like pretty quickly, he ends up coming over to our hostel because he's heard about us. And this guy just had such a warmth about him. I look at what's happening in the world and I just see, see everything that's going on and you know, kind of globally where I'd see that it all stems from a lack of love. I felt this one day, I was running and it just popped out of me and I was like, whoa, started crying. And it was the best feeling I've ever experienced in my entire life. And I realized, I was like, yo, I've just found, I've found my purpose and I found what I'm supposed to be doing. And yeah, and I dropped out of uni and, and yeah, and I, I flew over here four months later. I'm running and hitchhiking barefoot through every country on the east side of Africa, so I'm going like And it's just, it's just to spread a message of love and unity without 
without stipulations of what that has to be, right? And without, without borders. This perception that we have of what the whole world is, not just Africa, but the whole entire world, it's not, it's not, right? It's just how these thoughts that we have in these, you know, the med what the media tells us of Africa and of, and of the rest of the world. It's not the actual reality of what's happening. I, I think love is, is that thing, giving up control. What is love? Love is going, I can't fight this thing. This is new. I can accept this new thing that I've become, or I can fight to expel it and go back to being that thing that I understand and that I have control of. Sadly, a lot of times we think, especially in world news, it's like, oh, I'm just gonna like go and hide from it all. And it's like, stay out there, we need you. We need light out there, we need people of hope. We need voices that are gonna speak. It's inevitable that it's gonna spill out of you. I think love is a very relational thing. I think once we really access it, there is this almost this natural, natural desire to just share it and express it because you exude it then, it's just coming out of you. To be really expressive and, and sharing of love takes, to some extent, courage. It takes courage to be loving. You know, you're not worried about how people respond or if it's reciprocated. I think it's, it's just, it's a matter of just giving without expecting anything back. And the joy of that, it's unbelievable. It gives me goosebumps. Sincerely take care of yourself. Allow yourself to love yourself. And from that place, Sincere, sincere use of love, then you can spread love to others. It will not be superficial, it will not be, uh, you will not be hesitating. It will be from a sincere place of, I know how it is to love because I love here. Then I can really love there. Being loved is I love myself. So when I love myself, I'm in this position. What position being there for others? If you're interested in living a happier, healthier, longer, more fulfilled life, you have to give to others. And that's sort of weirdly selfish. I sat on the airplane on the way back and I meditated for about eight hours and I just repeated them over and over again, your highest vibration, your highest vibration, your highest vibration. And I knew that when I was done that the purpose of our lives for me is to finding your truth in your heart, living that because it makes you glow. It puts you into your highest vibration. And the more people that can be living in their, like, their highest vibration, their highest seed of light, it ends up turning on other lights, more lights, and more lights, and more lights. And really the greatest service that any of us could ever do in the world is to be the best versions of ourselves. We're going so fast. Like all of this happens in two and a half, three weeks. And then I'm back and I'm sitting at home and none of my family's really there. Uh, I think as I, as I sat at home actually, there was a lot, a lot going on inside of me. Um, Cause you know, what I've realized is that, you know, we have these experiences and experiences are incredible 
but it's reflection and it's allowing ourselves to zoom out and gain perspective that actually allows those experiences to change us. But what I realized in that moment is really what I was living is a life dependent on circumstance. I thought it was about the people, the places and the things, but in that moment I understood that it actually it was about how can I build a life that doesn't matter about the people, places and the things, that is non-circumstantial, right? I started to surrender and, and surrender. I had these connotations that surrendering was terrible because I, I played sports my whole life. When you surrender in sports, when you surrender in battle, you're waving the white flag. It means you lose, but no. I started to explore that word and, and surrender for me became this, this beautiful poetic gesture that I was surrendering to the fact that I am love that I, I'm unique. When all seems lost, take a second to stop and look up. Remember that every person that's ever been or ever will be has lived under the same sky. And at the heart of it all is love. A single word that when put to action possesses the power to transform everything. I look back on my own journey and see that the incessant partying, the epic adventures, even following a wizard, was all motivated by my longing to experience love. And while I wouldn't change a single thing, I now realize I went halfway around the world searching for something I was there all along. The good news, it's there for you too. And if you're lucky enough to be watching this, it's because your jar is still open. Your journey to love, still unfinished. Now the choice is yours. How do you want to fill it? Search the whole world to find what I need. You gave me your heart one time, now I see you are greater than all these things, greater than all these things, yeah. It's a blue marble sky. It's a blue greatest gift I can offer the world is love. Done. Some 
say love is just a heartache, you know, overrated. I say it's got its charms, that's me. And some say love is a stone's throw from all but hated. But I say jury's out, we'll see. Some say love is just a heartbreak and overrated. But I say that each is own, you see. And some say love is a fool's gold and you're the favorite. But gold is gold if you ask me. <laughs> and some say love is a battlefield. And some say love is our lover's heel. But I say love is love, that's me. Some say love is an open book Some say love is a fishing hook I say love to love you, see hey. Some say love is just a heartache You know the lady I say it's got its charms, that's me And some say love is a stone's throw from all but hated But I say the jury's out, we'll see Some say love is just a heartbreak and overrated But I say that each is own, you see And some say love is a fool's gold and you're the favorite But gold is gold if you ask me <laughs> Some say love is an open wound Some say love wants in a blue moon And I say do you love me still? Said my love had a little sting. I said your love is my everything. My heart went to beat, but it started to sing. It was something like. Oh.